You're listening to Yum Cha, a news podcast from Hong Kong Free Press, with me, Mercedes Hutton. This week, migrant workers and the children left behind, with Saiza Cruz Bakani. There are roughly 345,000 migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong. Arguably, their presence since the 70s has helped the city get rich by increasing the number of dual income households and, in turn, the city's labor force. Employed to take care of children and elderly family members, clean, cook, and do so much more, domestic workers are denied the rights afforded to other economic migrants. They cannot live independently, get just one day off a week, have no pathway to permanent residency, and cannot change jobs at will. Domestic workers' rights advocates I've interviewed in the past have likened their treatment in the city to modern-day slavery. However, the minimum monthly salary of 4,730 Hong Kong dollars, or about 600 US dollars, is still more than can be earned in most migrants' home countries, such as the Philippines or Indonesia. And this is why hundreds of thousands of women In Hong Kong, 98% of domestic workers are women, have moved overseas in the hope of providing a better life for their families back home. But, as photographer and artist Saiza Cruz Bacani points out, material benefits do not make up for a childhood spent without a mother. Saiza knows this firsthand. Her mum left the Philippines for a job overseas when Saiza was just a child, and she later worked alongside her mother for almost a decade in Hong Kong. Back in the city to promote an exhibition of her photography, and to discuss a report published by NGO Pathfinders Hong Kong and the University of Hong Kong about the need to protect children affected by migration. Saiza sat down with me for a conversation that spanned pandemic losses and painting, as well as her unique perspective, living and documenting the migrant experience. Slight side note, we recorded this episode in Saiza's hotel room, which had an aggressive central air conditioning system, so apologies for the persistent hum in the background. I'm here to talk about children who were left behind, like me, mm-hmm. because I'm one, in, one of many. And um, yeah, I'm here for the exhibition and for the launch of the Pathfinders report. So basically, yeah. I'm here with Pathfinders. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I think... Um, the report is really interesting, actually, because it focuses on the impact of migration yes. on those left behind, which is really not part of the conversation. And it should normally. Be. No, of course it should yeah. be. Yeah, it's yeah. You think about you know the the economic benefits, but you don't think about well, the, the social. Yeah. Well, um, it's actually the main uh, point that we're driving is we have to include children mm-hmm. in conversations of migration because most mothers migrate because of their children. Of course, yeah. Because they want to give an economic stability Mm -hmm. for their children. Because in an ideal world, no mother should be separated from their children. Ever. Yeah, right. Right. Except if it's an evil mother abusing the child. We we should separate them. Yeah. But, but, you know, so, but we're in reality, so I feel that it's important to start this conversation. It's important to offer this. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's more like an offering. It's not yeah. like a blanket solution. No, no. no it's, it's, it needs to... It's actually starting conversations, yeah. which is like a good start. It's, it's a starting point. Yeah, it's right? a starting mm-hmm. point. And I hope that we can continue the conversation. After growing up without her mother in Bambang, an inland municipality roughly 250 kilometers north of Manila, on the island of Luzon in the Philippines, Saiza traveled to Hong Kong to join her mum at work in the home of her employer, Mrs. Louie. And although now based in New York, Saiza says she still thinks of Hong Kong as one of her homes. I arrived in Hong Kong year 2006. Yeah, 2006. Mm-hmm. I just turned 19 at the time. Yeah, I came here to follow my mother, who's also a domestic worker. So I'm a second generation domestic worker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And had you been to Hong Kong before coming here? No, that was my first time leaving our town. Oh, really? And I was Hong Kong. Goodness. Like, it was like... How did that feel? It feels amazing. Yeah, right. Like, the first time I touched down Hong Kong, I sensed the kinetic energy. Yeah. And I was fascinated with the light, the buildings, Mm -hmm. how fast it is. I had a, like, 
a good time arriving in Hong Kong. I wasn't like, I, I mean, I was 19, so it was an adventure, you know. I I didn't know what was going to happen to me, but at that moment, I was like, oh my God, this city is beautiful. Mm-hmm. I still remember the smell. When I arrived at Mrs. Louis' home, I smelled the, the laundry detergent. Mm. I love that smell. Really? Yeah, because my room is near the, the, the laundry room. Mm-hmm. So when I arrived, I... That's the first uh, area that we went to, yeah. and I smelled it. I'm like, oh my god, that smells so good. So yeah. And do you still does that smell still resonate with you? Oh hell yeah! yeah. Like I love it. It's almost like a warm hug every mm. time. <laughs> That's so nice. I have this love for this city that I don't even know, you know, where, where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. But I kind of know because my formative <laughs> years yeah. is developed here. Yeah. So I. So everything is like almost a muscle memory. Mm-hmm. I was telling you a while ago that the moment I touched down, my Cantonese came back, my movement came back. I was holding my phone, but I was not even like bumping to any people. Like it's like almost a muscle reflex. And then the food is good too. Yeah. Like, oh, I love Hong Kong food. So I have this really, um, as I grew up, my relationship with the city have changed, mm-hmm. but I have that love for Hong Kong that, you know, I considered it my second home yeah. because half of my family was here. Yeah. Is here. Yeah. So for me, there's a special connection that binds me to the city. Like, it hasn't changed despite being away for four years, mm-hmm. you know, like. I yeah, that doesn't go away. Yeah, so. it doesn't go away. Mm-hmm. There's relationships here that has started years back, you know, like, you know, everyone in our building, uh, the doorman the security guards the cleaners this when i arrived they were like oh they found leila <laughs> it's almost like i just went away for yeah, a yeah. week yeah they were yeah. like oh you're you're back yeah. you, you know i love that you know like yeah like that type of community that i have built uh through the years is something that i really cherish because like this one uh so so you know like i've seen Every time I go home at night time, he's the he's the doorman mm-hmm. and he, he knows a lot about me that my other friends don't even know. You know what I mean? Like there was one time I went back home and I was I think I was a little bit drunk mm-hmm. and then I started telling him about my thing and my love life and all yeah, and then yeah. the next mor- morning when I saw I saw him again and he was like, Are you okay now? You know what I mean? Yeah. Those types of community. Yeah. These people you share so much with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course, Hong Kong is where you, you kind of your your career as a photographer, kicked off. Yes. How did that happen? Well, um, I was photographing the city really for my mom. I mean, it's a very interesting city. The light is beautiful. There's different shades of gray, mm. um, black and white. Like if you look at it, it's different shades of gray. So when you do a black and white photo, it it really pops out. Yeah. And then it's the energies. You can, once you capture the energy in, in a frame, you can almost feel it jumping yeah. out to you. Yeah. So, but then during that time, I was actually photographing for my mom mm-hmm. because my mom, you know, chose to work on her holiday to send more money to the Philippines, and she has not really experienced Hong Kong. So I thought through my photographs, at least she can see it. That's why I go to like places, different places back then. And that's when, you know, that's when, the, and then I post it on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And then someone, is, uh, uh, you know, a journalist in San Francisco saw it, sent it to the New York Times, New York Times like it, and then it's like a roller coaster. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I don't know. I didn't ask for it, but I think the universe pushed me. Put it out there. Put it out there, yeah. you know, like. I was happy. Yeah, yeah. I was happy with my mom, mm-hmm. Mrs. Louie. I was happy with my little world, right. you know? So I didn't be like, oh, what are they You weren't doing this? that to kind of further anything. Yeah, yeah, I was like, uh, I was I just was happy to be Yeah, photos. yeah. So, so, as I've said, it's something that the universe decided mm-hmm. for me. I didn't make a decision of it, you know? Saiza's photography is striking. She is known for her black and white images that immortalize intimate human moments, revealing the strength and vulnerability of those impacted by economic migration, human trafficking, and climate change. She is reported on women 
lured overseas by the promise of a job, who later find themselves subject to indentured servitude. She has turned her lens on indigenous Indonesians working on the very palm plantations that have displaced them. And she has photographed Hong Kong's migrant domestic workers, capturing tales of joy, abuse, and the breadth of emotions in between, including the story of her own mother, whose life, like sizes, has been reshaped by migration. Um, and your mother, she still works for the same family? Yes, she still works for Mrs. Louis. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's been here for 26 years now. I'm not sure about the, the year, but yeah. 20, let's say 25 year plus. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a very special relationship. Uh, same as me and Mrs. Louie, you know. Like, good relationship. Like, we treat each other with, I don't know, it's almost like a friendship that you can't let go just like that, you know. Like, I was really worried about them during the pandemic, yeah. and then I'm worried about my my pet, my father. It's like worrying because around the world. Yeah, that's the thing. When 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 you're mobile, right? Yeah. Like you have you leave pieces of your heart everywhere you go, and so when friends are dying, mm -hmm. it's almost like up to a point where I think I just had this realization, you know, last year around December I was like thinking about the people I lost and I'm like oh my god I didn't even sit down and take a moment to actually because it's almost like one by one you know like one from New York one from yeah. one so it's it's you know it's such a it's such a horrible feeling you know especially not being able to connect physically with those people yeah. at that time you, we, we didn't even have time to say goodbye no. there's no goodbyes mm -hmm. you know that was the hardest part and where were you during the pandemic i was in the philippines actually okay um i was documenting a lot of issues about the pandemic like nurses who were going on the field, risking their lives mm -hmm. without masks. I also did stories about pregnancy, about motherhood. Um, I covered it for the NPR. It's about uh, home birth in mm. the Philippines. So they, yes, and then I did a lot of work in the Philippines, actually. Yeah. It's almost like uh, rediscovering mm. my childhood and the town that I grew up with. and. I was very grateful that the international um, community, um, you know, allowed these stories to be seen because during the pandemic it was really centered on the cities, right? Yeah. And I live eight hours from Manila, okay. so I was really in a hometown. Like yeah. it, it's far from the main mm -hmm. city. Like the nearest airport is eight hours away. Mm -hmm. So oh, not really six now, but <laughs> I don't know. It's still a while. It's still a while. Yeah. So when I did these stories in our hometown, I was published in international publications. Mm -hmm. I was like really grateful about it because it kind of alleviate a lot of, of the pandemic anxiety yeah. <laughs> on my part. Yeah. I was like because it was a worrying time for a lot of like creatives because we can't go out right and my work is very relational mm -hmm. like I have yeah. to go out there do my research mm -hmm. speak to people yeah. and you can't do that during the pandemic yeah no you're yeah. forced to separate yeah, yeah. there's a distance mm -hmm. so I was able to do that I did a lot of stories in the Philippines and I also followed the doctor uh, for National Geographic and then She's the only doctor in her hometown. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, how how big is your hometown? Fifty six thousand people. Wow. Yeah. And she's one, one doctor. One community doctor. Wow. So that community doctor is serving fifty six thousand people. Yeah. And during the pandemic, she was actually the one who, who, made it possible to, um, you know, like because of the way she he did it. Our town was one of the few towns that was spared in the beginning. Right. Really? Yeah. Like, wow. there was no cases for 143 days. And that was like... And our town is like a town where everybody passed by. Right. So, wow. like, if you want to go to the north, you mm -hmm. have to go to our town. Mm -hmm. So you can't really stop people from, you know, you cannot control the, the number of people coming in because we have the vegetable terminal. And, right. And so... For 143 days, our town was zero COVID. Wow. And I don't even think Hong Kong managed that with its like extreme, stringent 
restrictions that were like top down. It's because of the way he did it. Like he had the group of nurses, mm. right? Community nurses were basically in through the collaboration with the village officials. It was it was like a fascinating system yeah, that they right. created. Yeah. Like of course there's less movement, mm-hmm. but but then. I mean, 143 days is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> of the zero COVID that time. Yeah. So I, I published it with National Geographic. Um, I also followed the movement of food. Mm. That was a good one. So from farmers, uh, from farmers' land mm-hmm. to the table, yeah. from the table, yeah. food insecurity kind of thing. So I did a lot during the pandemic. Until I get sick myself. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take for you to get COVID? It was the later part yeah, already, yeah. 2020. Oh, oh. no, 2021. Okay, okay. Before I moved to the US. Mm. And it's not because of my work. No. My grandfather died. And of course, uh, some of the restrictions lifted that time. And you know, people gathered for mm. funerals. Yeah. And so that's when I got it. I was actually the last one in her family to, right. to get it. Because I was busy taking care of everybody mm-hmm. who got it. It was a terrible ordeal. Mm-hmm. But at least I was vaccinated at the time. Yeah. If not, I'll probably be dead. I was, was in the hospital oh, for really? 12 days. Really? That's how oh my goodness. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, I came out of the hospital. And after two weeks, I flew to the US <laughs> to start, my, <laughs> to start my, my grad school. And I'm like, oh, right. Oh, yeah. Interesting times. Yeah, yeah, right. Is that the longest you've spent in the Philippines since yeah, leaving? Yeah, it was actually the longest. Mm. So it was one of those things where I, it's like discovering your root, we're discovering it again. I saw it with an eye of a visitor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and as an adult. As an adult too. So it's more like I realize how beautiful my hometown mm-hmm. is. How, um, green it is like we have long rivers greeneries mountains falls majestic falls um the people are nice so i learned how to drive which is the biggest oh, really? thing yep so i was like reporting right and and then i realized that because i can't drive and there was mm. no other you couldn't get around i, I cannot get around yeah. because there's no trans- public yeah, transportation yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm going to die of heat stroke first before COVID. Because right. I'm like walking with the cameras <laughs> in the heat. And I'm like, girl, you have to learn mm-hmm. how to drive. Take that into your yeah. hands. So I did learn how to drive during COVID. In 2017, Saiza was awarded a grant from Hong Kong-based non-profit WMA, with which she produced a book, We Are Like Air. Published the following year, in it, Sizer sought to reframe and humanize the migrant domestic worker experience. So we are like air because, because, you know, migrant workers for me are like air. They're important, uh, a necessity, mm-hmm. but mostly unseen. They're unseen, like yeah. air. And we are like air is a celebration of mm-hmm. the migrant workers. It's celebrating them as champions because they are the axis that carry both sides of migration. They're, they're actually carrying their families and the families they serve. Mm-hmm. You know, the families they left behind and the families they, they're serving. So both yeah, sides, yeah, right? Yeah. So um, it's a book. Um, so it's trilingual. Oh, okay. Um, so it's uh, English, uh, simplified Chinese, mm-hmm. and Tagalog. Oh, okay. So, it's like a, no- a photo novel. Mm. Um, you have to start in the beginning. Oh, you do. You can't just. You can't just like okay. skip it and okay. go to the middle and like, you know what I mean? Like it has to. It tells a story because it's a visual narrative mm-hmm. and there's text with it that ties it all together. Yeah. So it's eight different chapters, okay. eight different stories, mm-hmm. and the main anchor of the story is the story of my mother yeah. and our family. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's more like looking inwards rather than out outwards but then because it's eight chapters <laughs> it, it covers a lot yeah. you know so um the book has has you know it received a lot of of um it's good you mm-hmm. know i'm very glad about it uh, we press published published the book and i'm very grateful for them because you know 
I did not. I can't self-publish. Yeah, I'm yeah. not rich. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. for them to see the story mm-hmm. and invest on it, and of course WMA. Yeah, uh, they're the ones who who gave me the grant to mm-hmm. actually do it, and and it's a book about migration but not your typical story of migration where it's only focused on the sur- the survival the hardships mm-hmm. or the challenges it's all it, it's also a celebration of migrant mothers yeah migrants yeah because we have to celebrate them of course and yeah I, I was thinking about that like it's always easy to celebrate people like me who broke the ceiling <laughs> yeah right you know like, yeah but Often we forget that in everyday lives we have these women that are working, holding everything hold, together, holding everything together. They're like blues. Yeah, and we have to celebrate mm-hmm. them. For mm-hmm. me, they're champions. Yeah, like they're not just victims. Mm-hmm. They're champions, mm-hmm. you know. And their job is just a job. It's not who they are as no. people. They have their own hobbies. They have their own activities outside their jobs. They have their own hopes and dreams, anxiety, whatever. They're humans like us. Yeah, yeah. Recently, Siza has taken up painting, a practice she says is good for her mental health. And in a departure from her monochrome photographs, her canvases are bursting with colour. I use photography, it's my main medium, but yeah. I also paint. Ah, okay, and I didn't realise that. I also do multimedia. I just mm. released my painting this year, so paintings. I, I had uh, like an exhibition in Texas. I got a solid show out of my paintings, I'm so proud of it. When did you start doing that? I actually, I love painting more than photography since I was a child. Oh, really? Okay. Because, I don't know, it's my first uh, exposure to art, to the mm-hmm. art world. And so, from the books, yeah. I devoured images of paintings. Right. But then with uh, painting, I went back to it during the pandemic. Uh, okay. Because my painting for me is my idea of self-care. Mm-hmm. I'm still very much introverted. In my photography practice, I do a lot of... Um, human stories, human interest stories, mm-hmm. and of course, it's not always about sunshines and butterflies, and mm-hmm. somehow people like us absorb the secondhand trauma mm-hmm. of reporting about these issues. So the reason why I it was very colorful was I experienced panic attacks, uh-huh. and one of the things that really grounded me was identifying colors in yeah. my surroundings. Okay, like every right. time there's a trigger, and those triggers we cannot control. Mm. One thing that help stop the attack is like I look around and like that's a red, that's a blue, that's a yellow, and it just grounds me right. and and it it kind of like switch my brain into thinking that what you're experiencing is just a feeling. Mm. You're not gonna die. Mm-hmm. You'll be fine. Just keep looking at the colors, identify them. So it kind of like do this trick inside mm. my brain. That's why I started painting more colorfully. <laughs> that was my conversation with photographer and artist Siza Cruz Bacani. Thanks for listening. To check out any of her work, just search for her online. You've been listening to Yumcha, a news podcast from Hong Kong Free Press, written, produced, and edited by me, Mercedes Hutton. HKFP is a member of the Trust Project. Find out all about our journalistic standards by visiting hongkongfp.com forward slash ethics. And for more informative and impartial coverage, and to learn how to support our journalist-led newsroom, visit hongkongfp.com.